Welcome to a new series here on the Wars of Rebellion channel, based on my book, The Soul War Battles of Macon. The city of Macon in central Georgia was representative of many mid-level towns around the southern region. By the 1850s, Macon had not only dominated its hinterland, with the river and railroad network radiating out, the city also provided its surroundings with tools and equipment. As a result, a series of iron foundries emerged in the city to support the agricultural and railroad sectors. These iron works provided the backbone on which the Confederate military industrial complex turned the city into a vital supply center for the war effort. These very industrial capacities were also what made Macon a target in the last year of the war. Among the leaders of Macon's industrialization was Robert Finlay, owner of the Finlay Iron Works. Born in Scotland, Robert Finlay had come to the United States in 1828. A decade later, he came to Georgia, delivering a locomotive to the Monroe Railroad. He and his cargo traveled up the Altima and Okmulgee rivers as the only proper means of conveying such a heavy item was a riverboat. Upon reaching Macon, Finlay had to construct a temporary track from the river to the tracks already laid by the Monroe Railroad further inland. Realizing the future of Macon as a transport hub and the need for iron products, Finlay perceived the city offered him many professional opportunities. In October 1839, he invested in the Macon Brass and Iron Works, owned by Nathaniel Smith and William John McElroy. Soon the company enhanced its profile to include larger products up to steam engines. The Macon Brass and Ironworks reconstituted as the Findlay Ironworks. By 1847, Findlay expanded his operations, purchasing adjoining properties. As a major producer and employer in the city, including enslaved people, Findlay received many special favors from the city council. He also got permission to build a railroad spur to his factory but only if the cars were horse-drawn. By the mid-1850s, the Findlay Iron Works offered a diverse and multifaceted portfolio, on par with other industrial centers in the country. In April 1851, Findlay revealed his plans for an expansion of his Macon foundry to encompass a full city block along Oglethorpe and Third Street on the south side of Macon. At the cost of $20,000, Finley constructed a two and a half story building with a width of 50 feet and length of 312 feet. Finley installed 130 windows for natural light and ventilation. He even laid tracks to transport heavier products around the factory. The building was stuffed with a machine shop, finishing rooms, smithy, foundry rooms, casting and woodworking machinery. Finley's factory included other buildings with forges, office buildings, and more. To produce the items sought around town, Finley invested heavily in tools to make patterns for repetitive processes. By the end of the 1850s, Finley had gotten additional competition. 
John and Joshua Schofield had opened their own foundry. They even offered to beautify homes with iron railing. Like Finlay, the Schofields were British immigrants. The Schofield foundry initially split its work between producing directly for customers, but also for competitors. As a machine tool maker, Schofield was in high demand. With the fall of Fort Pulaski in Savannah in 1862, Confederate industrial activities in Savannah were no longer safe. Therefore, rebel authorities had to locate a new site for Savannah's industrial capacities. They worked the deal out with Finlay's, where the government leased the iron works for $25,000 per year. They hired Finlay's workers, rented the 12 largest warehouses in town, signed a contract with the Schofield Iron Works, and turned the facility into a new arsenal to support the rebellion's military needs. They quickly realized, however, that Finlay's facilities was insufficient for the new country's needs. With a staff of up to 500 workers, dramatically larger than Findlay's ironworks ever were, the Macon Arsenal produced shots, shells, pistols, rifles, ammunition, and entire artillery battery. Per day, the facility had an output of 125 artillery shells and 10,000 rounds of small arms ammunition. The Arsenal produced some 80 cannons, 12-pounder Napoleons, 10 and 30-pounder par parrot guns. Some of them used and captured by U.S. forces during the Battle of Chattanooga. Besides the Confederate arsenal, the evacuation from Savannah also included the Confederate State's Central Laboratory. The project to build a laboratory got underway in the fall of 1862, after purchasing over a hundred acres of land along the Macon and Western Railroad in the Vineville area, today just a grassy area. The decision to build in Macon was largely due to the explosive risks that laboratories posed to their surroundings. A number of accidents at other sites justified locating the laboratory in Vineville instead of Macon itself. The authorities rented enslaved people from the surrounding plantations to construct the building. However, delays plagued the progress to finish the permanent laboratory building. As a result, the rebellion ended before enslaved people completed the main structure. Macon also gained a Confederate armory to produce weapons. The city had provided the central government an area west of the city bridge. The land already contained several usable structures. In addition, the authorities worked out an agreement to use the old Macon and Western Depot. Besides the construction of buildings, James H. Burton also had to train people in the operation of machinery and tool making. Eventually, Burton obtained another 43-acre lot of land bordered by the Macon and Western Railroad, Calhoun, Hazel, and Lamar Streets. Located on the edge of town, the site was perfectly suited for the needs of the Confederate Armory. The arsenal, armory, and laboratory made Macon crucial to the success of the rebellion, but also disproves our assumptions of an agricultural South. The South had industrialized, and Macon was just one example. However, the major military facilities in the city also meant that Macon had a large target painted on itself, inviting enemy attacks. <laughs>